lights out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Joined in the studio with my boys, Austin. Hey, what up? Daniel. What's up, everybody? And boy, do we have a good episode for you today. We're going to be covering the Hoska Castle which has been nicknamed Europe's Gateway to Hell because there's some very mysterious happenings going on in this castle going back, I mean, I think it's like hundreds and hundreds of years. I think potentially it's thousands roughly even. a thousand, yeah. So castles are something that I absolutely love and I really haven't had a chance to go to Europe yet and like really explore some of these old castles because if you think about it, it makes sense. There's a lot of paranormal activity taking place in these, these places. Because if you look back at the medieval ages, I mean, it was just a totally different time. Brutal. Crazy, yeah. Horrific uh, deaths, and then the spirits are sticking around. Yeah, yeah. So it makes sense that there would be a fair amount of paranormal activity in these these places. Have you ever been to um, any castles before? No, I've actually never been to a... Yeah, me neither. Yeah. I, I love this whole time period quite a bit. and just love the stories and the brutality of, of just what life was like and... You know, they used to do crazy things to people when you got out of line. But this this one's very interesting because it's a castle that's virtually in like the middle of nowhere. And a lot of people are, are really stumped as to why they built this castle out there. And some of the things that took place in it definitely raise even more questions um, along with a lot of the activity that's been observed out there. And now I believe it's kind of more of just like a tourist attraction yeah, because um, the surrounding area is very scenic. It's beautiful. So Hoska Castle is located out in the Czech Republic, literally in the middle of nowhere. There's just trees all around it. A lot of people go out there for the scenery and hiking and all that kind of stuff. But then there's just this gothic stone castle that just kind of towers on top of this hill around, you know, surrounded by virtually nothing Yeah, nothing out there. I know people go out there for like romantic getaways and yeah. they're like, oh, it's a castle supposedly there are other big castles like way scattered out in the middle of nowhere too but this one's one of the bigger ones um but yeah it's kind of doesn't make any sense for why it's there yeah it's crazy because the czech republic has what two thousand castles or so yeah and the area of czech of, of the czech republic is about the size of what south carolina so, yeah is that crazy that's a lot of castles for such a small area yeah isn't uh transylvania near this area too i'm not sure because i think no. the story of like dracula's uh kind of comes out of this this same same area um and if you think about dracula's castle and things like that um i don't know it, it just kind of plays into this whole legend you know surrounding castles and creatures that may emerge from some of these places so it's a very very interesting story so that's what we're going to be getting into today here on Lights Out. But before we do, I just want to remind everybody to make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast here on YouTube. We really appreciate it. We do live premieres every Friday at noon or 1230, I believe, Mount Standard Time. And it's just a good time to get everybody together and kind of watch through the episode um, sort of as it goes live together. Austin or myself are usually um, hanging out in the chat for a bit. And yeah, it's been a really good time. I know you guys really have enjoyed some of the past episodes we've done. We really enjoyed doing the amusement park episode. That was a lot of fun. Oh, it's so, always a blast yeah. with those ones. <laughs> and then, you know, I was looking on YouTube the other day and the Ouija board episode that we did has just been absolutely crushing it. And it's just so many people are into Ouija boards as much. Like, I think it's because there's such a you know people have a very strong stance when it comes to ouija boards it's like yeah. you're either for them and have used them or you're like absolutely not yeah my aunt i i found out is 100 percent against won't even go near them if they're even nearby it creeps her the hell out and i almost you know i almost bought one for in here <laughs> to add to the studio um haunting that we have going on i did acquire a uh, third relic uh, a blessed crucifix um, which is which is behind me to hopefully balance out the energy in here because we've just had the strangest things going on here for the longest time pretty much since the show started um, we've had strange happenings and technological issues that made no sense but things have finally calmed down so we're just hoping that we can have a few weeks of just 
peace and calm. Yeah. I think you like you were talking about, I think we've balanced the energy yeah, in here. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we're good, but we also really appreciate everybody that's gone and bought any merch. Uh, there's definitely some items still out there. We're actually running a sale right now, 20% off all t-shirts. Um, I think we just added a few more items to that sale as well. Um, we're trying to just make room for the new collection that's coming here in the next month or two. Um, which again is going to be a cryptid collection, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but that's milehiremerch.com. With that being said, let's just go ahead and dive right into the haunting of the Hoska Castle. About 40 miles north of Prague, the Hoska Castle sits on the edge of a cliff overlooking a dense forest. Tall trees, swamps, streams, and high cliffs cover the region. And supposedly, the original builders believed they were constructing the castle around the gateway to hell. And this castle is the last blockade for the demons trying to escape the lowest levels of the underworld. When World War II broke out, SS Nazis stormed the castle after Hitler annexed this region. And pagan paintings and Christian symbols can be seen embedded in the stone walls. The first original chimera was three heads, one was a lion, one was a goat, and one was a snake. Some SS bodies were cremated in the chapel during secret ceremonies. Whatever this apocalyptic event was, it had a strong enough force to blow open an interdimensional portal. So like I kind of alluded to in the intro of this episode, the Czech Republic is known as the castle capital of the world. Definitely on my travel list for sure is the Czech Republic. I'm hoping to do like a Europe trip and it's eventually Same. I have a kid. I have a kid now and that just <laughs> <laughs> so before you have kids go and travel as much as you can because once you have kids it's very difficult to travel noted especially outside of the country. I couldn't even imagine going on multiple flights with a, a young child but people do it which you know kudos to those people. I'm not that patient. The Czech Republic is roughly the size of South Carolina and again has at least 2,000 castles within its borders. But the most famous is Prague Castle, which is the centerpiece of the country's capital and the largest castle complex in the world. The castle was strategically built near the central market at the crossroads of several trade routes, which makes sense. Plus, it gave the city a strong defensive position. This was how most castles served their purposes. But as for another castle nearby, Hoska Castle. It had none of these features, and many still wonder why it was ever built in the first place. About 40 miles north of Prague, the Hoska Castle sits on the edge of a cliff overlooking a dense forest. Tall trees, swamps, streams, and high cliffs cover the region, halfway between Prague and the Czech border. Today, people often visit for its beautiful nature hikes and tours of other cliffside castles. Even though Hoska Castle can be found here, it's not a romantic getaway like the others. It's an early Gothic castle built in the second half of the 13th century. It was most likely built under the rule of Ottokar II of Bohemia during his reign from 1253 to 1278. It's believed he funded the labor and resources for the project so that he could use a location to manage his properties. But folk tales say the castle was built to protect the overworld from demonic creatures that crept through a fissure in a limestone cliff. Today, this castle is considered one of the best preserved castles from that time period. Its Gothic chapel, a knight's drawing room, and a green chamber with Gothic style paintings can still be explored today, and pagan paintings and Christian symbols can be seen embedded in the stone walls. But despite its appearance, its mysterious history has given the castle its iconic status. According to rumors, the castle was oddly built with its defenses facing inwards which makes absolutely no sense why you would build this huge stone castle to not have outward facing defenses. Yeah. So why, why is that? Maybe the architects were worried about something getting out rather than something getting in. And supposedly the original builders believed they were constructing the castle around the gateway to hell. And this castle was the last blockade for the demons trying to escape the lowest levels of the underworld. Unfortunately, the castle has been renovated several times over the centuries, and there's no trace of its interior defenses. But some old folk tales, paintings, and records of Nazi occupation suggest that this castle is a lot more than it seems. Rumors of paranormal hauntings and ancient spirits have infested the building, 
and the area surrounding it seems to have a few secrets of its own. Until the collapse of the USSR, this castle had been abandoned for decades, and when its doors opened once again, its mysteries began to unravel. Through a long history, its records have been destroyed and fabricated, and most of its legends have been passed by word of mouth. The mysteries have left many unanswered questions, and one of the biggest questions is, why does this castle exist in the middle of nowhere? Unlike the Prague Castle 40 miles south, Hoska Castle's location makes no practical sense. There were no medieval trade routes here and there was no strategic resources nearby. And it was never a military front. Plus, there's no water source nearby, which is important for a castle. So the people who lived there had to drink from a rain collection cistern. There was also no kitchen. And the food was either imported, foraged, or hunted before being cooked over a flame. Even though it was a noble residence up until the 18th century, there was no sign of luxury or comfortable living here. And at one point, all of its defenses, like I said, faced inwards. This goes against all standard architecture layouts for castles at the time. So what exactly were the original architects so afraid of? Dating back to the 9th century, the earliest stories of nightmarish creatures began spreading around the region. Only a small wooden tower stood on the cliffside at the time. Many of the nearby villagers held Slavic pagan beliefs, but soon many began converting to Christianity. The conversions were peaceful, but this religious change built up tensions in the region. A few of the local nobles and landowners were now Christians, and they began removing pagan statues and monuments from local villages. Some even died for their faith. But soon enough, the locals realized there was a much bigger problem nearby. Rumors went around that somewhere in the forest was a portal that connected the underworld to the overworld. A massive fissure had opened up in one of the limestone cliffs near the wooden tower. And when the locals approached, they could smell fire and brimstone escaping from below. And they claimed that it was so deep that no one could see the bottom, even if the sun was at its highest in the sky. If someone dropped a rock down the crack and waited for a sound to mark the bottom, they would never hear it. So it was clear that this was no ordinary fissure. And rumors began circulating that hell was somewhere deep down there. The crack eventually got the nickname, Hole to Hell. And the nearby residents who lived in the forest cabins noticed strange dark creatures crawling out of the pit at night. These were pagan chimeras, which are part human and part animal. And they had come to terrorize the villagers. So you've probably heard of uh, chimeras before, sphinx, centaurs, jackalopes, I love jackalopes. griffins. They're all uh, examples of famous chimeras. Uh, in some, they're basically just animals with human body parts or vice versa. And they stemmed way back from the original chimera of ancient Greece. Uh, this name was first seen in the Iliad, which scholars believe traces back to like the 7th or 8th century. So pretty long time ago. This was, uh, uh, the first original chimera was an insane looking creature. It makes no practical sense. It had three heads. One was a lion, one was a goat, and one was a snake. And sometimes there are different versions of it. Like it has the, the tail of a goat and the body of a tiger or some, you know, oh, there's, there's oh. different versions, but that's the original is this three headed creature. And they were all attached to this one body. And supposedly it could also breathe fire. The ancient Romans were so inspired by these mythological creatures years later that they even surgically sewed their own chimeras together. They were obsessed with this idea of like part human, part animal. So one of the first records of a physical chimera existing was surgically created by a dead man and a dead horse. Oh, wow. Yeah, they took basically the upper half of a man and sewed it to where the head of a horse would be. And then they preserved it in honey and put it on display. Interesting. Yeah, so these were... Did they kind of look at it as like a, a god in a way? Like, do they worship this? Or is this more so... It comes... It stems from Greek mythology, I believe. And this was the Romans who kind of got influence from that. And so, yeah, in a way, it's... A, kind of a religious creature so to speak yeah i don't know about you but i love to eat 
not only do I love to eat, I love to cook the food that I eat. And for the longest time, I was going to the grocery store, buying ingredients, you know, finding a recipe online. And by the time I got done with grocery shopping, getting home, getting all the ingredients prepped, the meal cooked, not only was I spending way too much time in doing all that, but also money-wise, I ended up spending way more money because what I would end up doing is making way too much food and then that food would go to waste. Now, thanks to Every Plate, which is owned by HelloFresh, love all of those meal kits, Every Plate actually is 25% cheaper than grocery shopping with no hidden fees. And what's great is that through their app or the website, you can actually go on and pre-select your meals for weeks and weeks and weeks in advance, which is really nice. So it's kind of set it and forget it. And then the boxes just show up at your door each week. Everything is absolutely delicious. It's easy to cook. Every plate provides plenty of delicious variety so you'll never get stuck in a cooking rut with 25 tasty and affordable recipes to choose from each week. It's easy to find something for everyone. Plus find delicious options all day long with up to 22 sides, snacks, desserts, and more. So seriously, if you haven't tried out Every Plate, do it now. You can get $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code LIGHTSOUT149. Get started with Every Plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code LIGHTSOUT149. So yeah, through the centuries, these it was considered you know a pagan creature, but over time, they changed... And instead of just this one chimera, the three-headed beast, they adapted. And eventually, as the centuries passed, this is what these villagers thought they were seeing escaping from this fissure was just like these weird hybrid creatures, part human, part wow. animal, or like these weird humanoid type creatures. Um, but instead of the typical Greek or Roman chimeras, these were like demonic they were humanoids but you couldn't even tell what animals they were mixed with a lot of the times it was like black eyes and oh, that's terrifying. black skin and just you know didn't even make sense like it wasn't like oh the head of a lion the yeah body of a calf the feet of a goat whatever this wow. was like there were a bunch of disturbing type creatures coming out of this hole i do find it interesting too that you do see these chimeras across multiple civilizations you know the greeks the Romans, the Egyptians, yeah, obviously have a lot of uh, half man or or half human, half animal uh, gods and goddesses. If you look at that, you know, obviously you got the Sphinx, and you've got you know Ra and and some of these others that are half human and half animal. Which I, I always am curious about, you know, more of the spiritual significance of that and where that came from originally, yeah. you know, and and like. Is there something more to that, or is this just purely a fictional concept that they, that they came up with for whatever reason? But it seems like there's absolutely deeper meaning to all of these these creatures, and um, especially with the Egyptians. Obviously, you're talking about their gods and goddesses, and uh, the Sphinx obviously has a more in depth um, meaning behind it, which I don't even know that we fully understand. Right. Um, so I just wonder if it, you know, because it's looking back at it it's very easy for us to be like oh you know they were very they were either very imaginative or there is more to this than what we even know and maybe this is something that you know i like to always consider the idea that is it possible that there were these hybrid beings on the earth at one point in time and over time either they were killed off or you know they disappeared somewhere yeah, and in a sense, it's like a cryptid, right? Yeah, it's, exactly. And like what we've covered, you know, we were talking about the chupacabra, which is hybrid animals, and we got into that. So it's not that far off, you know? Right, especially, I mean, when you're talking about something crawling out of a pit and it being a portal of some sort, you got to wonder if there's, you know, if you do believe in portals across the earth to other dimensions or, um, you know, maybe it's not hell, but it's some other dimension that, runs in parallel to ours or is just a part of our reality that we just don't aren't able to perceive for whatever reason and you know there's similarities in you know the types of animals and dna that you know come out of these places yeah. i don't know it's all it's all very interesting to me um that especially going back in history you see this across so many different civilizations that i feel like you can't just totally ignore it and be like oh that's just a bunch of you know fairy tale so yeah this chimera creature 
this name was first seen in the Iliad, which was written by Homer. And uh, scholars believe that traces back to the 7th or 8th century BC. So quite a long time ago. One of the earliest known writings that we have of, you know, if you want to call it fiction or what it myth, mythological writings, you know, yeah. So it dates back quite a long time. And who's to say, like, if he just thought of that himself or if that stemmed from something else. Yeah, huh? it, it really makes you wonder if th- this is just purely, you know, fictitious images and, and writing or if this is actually like eyewitness accounts of of things that we're just perceiving as fiction. I mean, you look at Plato and how he talked about Atlantis and now, you know, we're, we're starting to find more evidence that Atlantis may have actually existed in some form, um, which that's a whole other topic, but it's just kind of all lends to that. I don't think you can totally discount all of these different accounts of creatures and hybrid creatures and portals that are, you know, you're, you're seeing these strange things crawl out of as, as complete you know, nonsense or, or, uh, fiction. So pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. And I mean, we'll see that the yeah. people at the time took this pretty oh, damn yeah. seriously. So. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's something to that. According to those that witnessed some of these creatures, some of them had bat wings that flew up from the fisher at night and sucked the blood out of livestock. Others crawled from the pit with their massive claws and lit the crop fields on fire with their breath. With these creatures running amok, most villagers didn't have the luxury of just being killed. Instead, they were assaulted by these creatures before being dragged into the fissure and forced into hell. And many who were dragged down into the pit actually later emerged. But now, they were also grotesque hybrid monsters. To try and stop the attack, some peasants tried hauling lumber and rocks to the fissure and throwing them into the pit. But it was no use. The crack would just swallow any of these rocks or debris. They even threw the bodies of dead villagers down into the pit, but it seemed that no matter how much they shoved into the hole, it would never be filled. So the chimeras continued haunting the forested countryside. Villagers would wake up to find their livestock slaughtered, their lumber burned and their land destroyed, and the hybrid demons of hell were always blamed. The growing concern eventually got the local duke involved, and after officials met, they considered covering the crack, but they didn't want to build over it just yet and their curiosity got the best of them. As they wanted to figure out what was really down in that limestone pit that smelled like sulfur. Some officials also didn't believe anything was down there at all, and they wanted to prove that the local pagan peasants were just complaining and making up stories. What they eventually discovered earned Hoska's castle its legendary status in paranormal history. By the 13th century, officials were willing to use their local prisoners as test subjects. The duke from the local Duba clan controlled the region at the time, and he gave his prisoners a choice between the gallows or a chance at discovering whatever the hell was down in that limestone pit. If they chose the pit and survived, they could walk free. A small group of prisoners volunteered, and officials led them to the crack and selected one prisoner to go down. He was a young, healthy man, and they thought he could handle the descent. As they attached climbing chains and a long rope to him, they told him to holler if he got into any trouble down there, and then they slowly lowered him into the crack. They watched as he disappeared into the darkness, and they kept lowering the man further and further down into the pit, and he still hadn't reached the bottom yet. 20, 30, 40 feet, and still nothing. Eventually, the rope quickly jerked downward, and the other men barely held on as the rope slipped and burned their hands. From down below, they heard the man screaming in terror, and he begged the others to pull him out. So the other prisoners heaved on the rope and brought him back up as fast as they could, but it was already too late. When the man reappeared in the light of day, they noticed his hair had turned from brown to white, and when they got him back to the surface, some said he had aged 20 or 30 years. Not only that, but something inside the man had snapped. He was no longer the same man that they had just sent down there minutes earlier. He was now sobbing and screaming things in gibberish. He mentioned a rancid smell, total darkness and distant screams before he collapsed to the ground. They tried to treat him, but his psychological wounds were too deep, and he ended up dying only two days later. The official cause of death was fright. Obviously the other prisoners refused to go down into the pit after this, so they were sent back to their prison cells. 
and after the Duke witnessed the pit for himself, he realized it wasn't worth investigating any longer. So he decided to send word to the king and negotiate sealing the hole to hell as fast as they could. The first thing they did was cover the fissure with massive stone plates, and then they built a chapel directly on top, hoping the spiritual building would fend off the demonic terrors beneath the surface. Then they added several more buildings and inward-facing defensive walls, plus they made sure no stairs led from the central courtyard into the main building. Archers were placed on the defensive walls 24-7 to watch if anything crept out from beneath the surface, and they were ordered to kill on sight if they saw anything that didn't look human. Once the castle was fully up and running, the chimeras disappeared, and the land returned to a quiet, peaceful region. But the memories of the chimera attacks wouldn't soon be forgotten. In the 14th century, artists painted frescoes across the castle's interior walls. They stood as a reminder of the violent attacks from the creatures that had emerged from that pit. After officials noticed that the castle was doing its job, it remained mostly empty. But as everyone left, the few who stayed behind noticed strange events inside of the castle walls. In the chapel, loud scratching noises came from under the floors, and the few occupants who cycled in and out of the castle over the years believed that the paranormal energy of this region wasn't entirely gone. It was only contained. Between 1584 and 1590, the castle went through Renaissance-style modifications to match the time period, but all the fortifications mostly stayed the same. The underworld was still contained. But after a few decades, in 1618, the Thirty Years' War broke out, and many became worried that this containment would soon be destroyed. The Thirty Years' War was a religious conflict between Catholics and Protestants, mostly fought in Central Europe. And I didn't realize this, but at the time, this would be one of the longest and bloodiest wars in human history uh, per capita, because it's estimated that around 8 million people died from violence, famine, and disease caused by the conflict. They said as high as 20% of Germany's population died, which is a crazy amount. And in some cities, in some areas, it was up to 50%. So imagine like waking up tomorrow and 50% of Denver is just gone. Wow. As All the, in the name of God? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Isn't that wild? Oh, man. It seems like we've seen this plenty of times too, right? But as the war went on, of course, it was less about religion and more about who would control, control Europe. Control, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So the violence reached far and wide, and even though Hoska, you know, it's way out in the middle of nowhere, it's not a strategic position, no trade routes, no nothing, no running water, um, it did become actually a small focal point in the war, uh, not necessarily for any government troops, but many mercenary armies that were being contracted uh, decided to Make use it as their, like a base a little headquarters yeah yeah or they're like come close and we're gonna open up this pit yeah yeah right <laughs> unleash what's hiding down there yeah this year i've been really trying to get my health under control get myself back working out eating healthier and taking the right vitamins and supplements because those are so so important for maintaining an overall healthy lifestyle and keeping your body young right so in order to do that, I've been utilizing a subscription service called Care Of that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently to my door every month. And what's great is that Care Of wants to make it super easy to take care of you. And it recognizes everyday wellness is different for everyone. So what you do is you go online, you take a short in-depth quiz about your lifestyle and health goals for a personalized doctor-backed recommendation. It gives you exactly what nutrients, supplements, vitamins you should be taking. What I love about Care Of versus some of the other competitors out there is that they put all of your vitamins in these little care packs and they come in this neat little box that just sits on your nightstand or maybe in your bathroom. And each day you just grab a packet. It's already got all of your, your uh, vitamins in there and you're good to go. I've been taking ashwagandha, which has been absolutely amazing for not only my sexual health, but also just keeping me calm and feeling good. So if you want to get your vitamins and supplements under control and get what your body needs. For 50% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter code LIGHTSOUT50. For 50% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter code LIGHTSOUT50.
During this war, a Swedish mercenary leader named Oronto took over the castle. He and his men had made a name for themselves in the nearby town of Melnik, where they raped and pillaged. Oronto had also become known as a sorcerer of black magic. There were even rumors that he could deflect an arrow with his powers. While the castle was abandoned during the war, Oronto used it as his headquarters, and they got their supplies by robbing the nearby villages. He had heard rumors of the castle's demonic past, and he considered himself a master of sorcery, and he had his eye on Hoska Castle for years. He was fascinated with the legends of chimeras and the hole to hell that remained underneath the surface. Once he settled in, Oronto then began his experiments with alchemy and black magic inside of the castle walls. Being so close to the hole to hell meant that his powers might be greater here, but the locals soon accused him of performing black magic rituals inside the chapel. His men had also been going out at night and kidnapping local women, so Oronto could use them for blood rituals and alchemy experiments inside the castle. Between the risk of opening the gates of hell and constant abuse, it got to the point where the villagers were ready to wage war against the Swedish mercenaries. But instead of war, they decided to make their moves quietly. Two huntsmen went over to a local blacksmith, and the man crafted them blessed silver bullets under a half moon. Then the huntsmen loaded their rifles and waited until dark before creeping up to the castle. They checked through each first floor window until they spotted Oronto. He was at his alchemy station working, and it was rumored that his latest attempt was to make an elixir of an endless life. The huntsmen outside aimed their rifles at Oronto and called out his name to make sure it was him, and as he turned around, they then shot him with the blessed silver bullets. As he fell to the ground, he called for his black hen. This hen was supposedly one of his occult experiments, and he begged the hen to save him. But after other mercenaries inside the castle heard the gunshots, they found Oronto dead on the floor, and the huntsmen were long gone. He lied in a pool of his own blood, shot through the eye, surrounded by the alchemy ingredients for his failed eternal life elixir. Kind of ironic that he died making an eternal life elixir. Yep. Such is life, I guess. I guess so. I wonder what his final thoughts were in that moment. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like, damn, it maybe I'm work. not that powerful. <laughs> yeah, right. I like how he has a a black hen. Yeah, right. What the hell's going on Call there? It over. <laughs> yeah. And after that, his band of mercenaries later disbanded. Some were arrested and brought to justice. But now, once again, Castle Hoska was abandoned. After the Thirty Years' War ended, Emperor Ferdinand III ordered the castle's tower and moat to be dismantled. And supposedly, this is when this inward-facing defensive walls were also destroyed. Ferdinand wanted to make private castles more approachable and less defendable. In the early 18th century, the castle became a remote house for nobles. But after a while, no one wanted to stay there, and the castle fell into disrepair until being renovated in 1823. And soon after its renovation, a Czech poet visited the castle in 1836. His name was Karl Heinrich Maka, and during his walking tour through the region, he only stayed in the castle for one night. But during his stay, he had a mind-opening experience of absolute horror. He later wrote a letter to a friend, Edward Hindle, describing his strange visions within the castle walls. When he fell asleep that night, he had several vivid dreams. One was a terrifying vision of his soul being dragged into the pit beneath the chapel. He was then transported into a hellish future. Machines and technology had taken over a ruined city, and smog filled the air, and he wandered aimlessly through the streets in horror and despair. Eventually, a young girl approached him in the streets, and she told him he was in the city of Prague, and the year was 2006. She then lured him to a small wooden casket the size that could hold a small child. And when she opened it, several moving pictures lined the interior walls, each displayed images of mechanized horror. In the next moment, he was teleported to a high sandstone cliff, and he walked along its edge in near darkness. A bit of moonlight illuminated his path, but the sandstone pathway was riddled with holes that projected a dim, eerie yellow light. These lights looked like the lights that came from the large apartments that towered over the outskirts of Prague. He described the modern Sidlisti apartments from his vision. But in 1836, this style of building hadn't even existed yet, and after this his nightmare ended. He couldn't piece together what it all meant. 
but many believe that the haunting energy from the pit of hell had infected his dreams and tried to tell him something. Carl ended up dying from pneumonia on November 6, 1836, only a few months after visiting the castle. Because of his vision, some modern theories think that the portal beneath the chapel isn't actually a portal to hell, but a portal to a parallel universe. There on the other side, some sort of apocalyptic event occurred, and the earth was now in flame and chaos. Whatever this apocalyptic event was, it had a strong enough force to blow open an interdimensional portal into our world. After the poet's visit, not much happened at the castle for almost a century. It was later bought by Princess Hohenloa in 1897, and then sold to Joseph Simonek, the president of Skoda Car Company. Soon enough, the castle would see its most evil occupants, possibly even more evil than the demons locked beneath the chapel floors. When World War II broke out, SS Nazis stormed the castle after Hitler annexed this region. This section of land was known as Sudetenland. It was once settled by ethnic Germans during the reign of Ottokar II. Czechoslovakia controlled it until 1938 when Hitler wanted the region to join Germany. After the Munich Agreement, Nazi tanks and troops trudged through the swampy forest and took over Hoska Castle and the surrounding region. Since everyone knew this wasn't a defensive position, many thought the Nazis had secret goals here. The SS quickly made the property off limits to civilians, and only SS troops and Nazi officials were allowed inside. So outsiders began wondering what was really going on behind closed doors. Supposedly this SS outpost at Hoska soon became a building for the Lebensborn program. This was the program that started from the Nazis' obsession with eugenics and racial purity. It was rumored that the rooms inside the castle were used for breeding the Aryan race. They would escort Germanic women inside and the SS men would have sex with them, and some of the rooms were converted into nurseries for the Nazis' superhuman race. But this wasn't the only rumor that spread. Many theories focused on the hole to hell and what the Nazis might be doing with it. After the rise to power, it became obvious that high-ranking Nazis were obsessed with black magic and the occult, especially when they began to lose the war. In 2015, the Czech National Library unearthed 13,000 books on the occult and witchcraft from a Nazi vault that hadn't been looked at since the 1950s, and many of these might have been once stored in Hoska. This was believed to be a collection put together by Hitler's right-hand man, Heinrich Himmler, and most of its books focused on the history of witch hunts and witchcraft. I didn't realize how obsessed Nazis were with the occult. I thought this was more of an urban legend, but Heinrich Himmler, I'm not a big war World War II buff, but supposedly Himmler was really into this shit. And uh, Himmler was a pivotal figure. I mean, I'm sure if you know anything about World War II, you've probably heard this guy's name before. He was a pivotal figure in World War II. He was known for being the second most powerful man in the Third Reich. He headed the SS, also known as the Schutzstaffel, which translates to protective echelon. And this was basically the elite core of political Nazi soldiers. You've probably seen them in movies. Um, they wear the black uniforms. They got the red patches on their arms yeah. with the swastikas, two lightning bolts on their collars for the SS insignia. Um, and they have the silver skulls on their hat. Have you ever seen the, uh, it kind of became a meme a while back it's the david mitchell and it was like his one of his sketch comedy shows and it's the are we the baddies huh. sketch i don't know if you've ever seen uh -huh. that you should you've seen it danny yeah yeah basically they're in the trenches and they're like oh screw these soviet troops blah 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 and david mitchell walks up to him and they're in the full uniform and he's like wait a minute have you looked at our caps yet they're we have skulls on our caps are are we the baddies like as in like we look like villains, right? We're dressed like villains. I, so it's almost like, I don't know if it was an intimidation mm. thing, but clearly these guys look like villains. Yeah. Well, they would like scar themselves. Yeah. To, to, look, to, make, scarier. to look scarier. They yeah. would put like, uh, they'd cut their faces up and put horse hair into their faces to make these really nasty scars. And it was just, uh, I think like a fear thing. Yeah. Trying to do. So scary, scary dudes. Um, 
and this organization, it's actually started really small, but by World War II, it boomed into hundreds of thousands. I think it was maybe like half a million approaching a million at, at a certain wow. point. Um, it makes sense that they would be, you know, especially as the war starts, you know, not going in their favor to start being like, oh, well, maybe we should try some alternative methods here to try to drum up support. That was exactly one of the reasons they did it. Um, these, I mean, if these guys weren't scary enough, these are also mostly the guys who are running the death camps. Right, right. Um, Absolutely H evil individuals. Yeah. Himmler often chose these troops for their physical perfection and racial purity. Yeah. So, you know, there's stupid blue eyes, blonde hair, like certain height and whatever. Um, they were educated on racial hatred and conditioned to ignore human suffering. War crimes. Great. And, yeah, yeah, right. That's exactly what you want. War crimes. Monsters. And yeah, absolutely. That's what they were breeding. Killing machines is what they're, they're creating. Yeah. yeah. And their motto was, thy honor is thy loyalty. So basically for the cause, you know, right. that was their number one directive. Um, and in a sense, I mean, looking back, they're kind of just like a big militarized cult, you know? Yeah. It's like, that, yeah, they really are. Um, and that's what they wanted, you know? Well, I think they, they, I mean, they really clearly believed in their mission and what they were doing. And even though there's no basis in reality whatsoever with it and, it's just, I mean, it's it's crazy to think back that that's not even that long ago. You know, we're talking like 1920s, 1930s. I mean, we're not even out of 100 years yet. It hasn't even been a century since this all happened. Yeah. Which is crazy to think about. Yeah, it's disturbing. It's very disturbing. So Himmler was really known for his fascination with the occult, mysticism, and the supernatural. The obsession entered Nazi culture in the 1930s when they all focused on Aryan roots and this quote-unquote pure race. They often rejected the status quo of research that was done into the origins of the earth, which had been done by a lot of Jewish researchers. And as a way to reforge history and scientific research, Himmler began looking toward the occult for answers. During their early research expeditions, they met a woman in Finland who claimed to be a witch, and she had supposedly predicted their arrival and she explained how their Aryan roots were connected to the supernatural. These expeditions took them all across the world and they reached deeper into the spiritual and supernatural side of things. On the cusp of their research, World War II began and Himmler was so obsessed with the occult, he even built an entire castle dedicated to its relics. This was known as Wolfsburg Castle in Western Germany. Um, if you've ever heard of it, this is actually the castle that inspired Wolfenstein. Do you mm, remember those? Yeah. Games? Did you ever play yeah, them? Yeah. Yeah, I remember those. So apparently Nazis were obsessed with castles and Himmler wanted to make this castle his quote unquote Mecca. This is where he wanted his SS troops to come and study the occult. Mm. And they were kind of trained in their ideologies. The castle was built back in 1609. And it was actually used for witchcraft trials back in 1631. Strange enough, the the SS, and especially Himmler, the reason not only did they have a lot of witchcraft books because they were looking into the occult and black magic, supposedly he wanted to tie in the Aryans' plight, like they were kind of victims, and he wanted to tie it into like, hey, we're connected to, this is basically like the witch trials. Like we feel like we're this small group that's targeted, right? but we're actually the superhuman race. So they were also obsessed with the witchcraft trials as mm. well. Just like Hoska, this castle was also a focal point in the 30 years war and it was burned by Swedish troops in 1646. Four years later, it was repaired. It was then burned again in 1815 after it was struck by lightning. By the 1920s, it was renovated into a museum, youth hostel, and restaurant, but in 1932, the Nazis took control. Two years later, Himmler formally took the castle for himself and he converted it into a leadership school for the SS. And in true Nazi fashion, they operated a concentration camp right next door, mostly filled with Jehovah's Witnesses and Soviet POWs. Inside the castle, they taught the SS troops Aryan folklore history and ideological political training. So in other words, this is where they brainwash, brainwash you, yeah, the SS troops. 
Um, and since castles are so closed off, people were concerned. There were even rumors of UFO operations, uh, Nazi zombies began circulating. Mm. But what was actually going on was much scarier. Their goal was to prove the existence of an Aryan superior race with the help of pseudoscience and the occult. And Himmler made sure that no mention of the castle would ever appear in any newspaper or books at the time. So much like Hoska, this yeah. was a very closed off operation. And the only reason we know what was going on inside there was they lost the war. That's right. really the only reason why we have this. We recovered a lot of their books and things that they were teaching. Yep. He wanted to keep his teachings of Germanic mysticism, rune worship, racial doctrines, and ancestor cult a secret. So this is why he kept it so closed off. Only the most loyal SS troops were ever allowed into this sanctuary. And Himmler believed that if the Nazis could win the war, this was like what you were saying, um, this is where they believed if they used the occult to win this war, that then their spiritual ideologies would basically become the number one, right? So this Wellesburg would become their center of the new world, which is what they called it. Like kind of like uh, how the Vatican is for uh, it, the Catholic faith and exactly that region of the world is kind of like the center. Yeah, so I mean, imagine if they won the war, this would be, be like a scary world, man. Yeah, SS occult would be, you know, a huge religion, basically. Can't even imagine what that would be like. Right. Oh Luckily, by 1945, the Allied forces attacked the castle. The SS tried to light everything on fire and bury the relics and treasures. Some of these treasures supposedly have never been recovered. There's a bunch of like death skull rings that they oh, wow. had for SS troops and stuff they buried and were never recovered. Um, so yeah, it basically during World War II, it became clear to everyone that the SS and Himmler were just obsessed with the occult and they were also obsessed with finding relics, which inspired, funny enough, the Indiana Jones movies. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. If you think about it, you know, the Nazis and they're looking for oh, relics, the Holy yeah. Grail and stuff. And I never really put, I never thought that was reality. I thought that was just Steven Spielberg and George Lucas yeah. having fun and like, ooh, yeah. what if Nazis were into relics? But it actually stems from reality. I'm surprised there's not a movie on the takedown of Himmler's castle. Yeah, that would be and sweet. And like him and the occult um, practices that he did. That would be a pretty, pretty interesting movie. Yeah, I'd watch that. As many of you know, I have two businesses. I have a CBD company and then I also have my media company, which produces all of our podcasts. And on each company, we utilize stamps.com for shipping, whether it's shipping out CBD products to our customers or shipping merch to all of you out there. Stamps.com gets it because for the last 25 years, they've been helping businesses just like mine to save time and money. What I absolutely love about Stamps.com is they eliminate the need to go to the post office ever. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer, and they even send you a free scale. If you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through the Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart, which we use both WooCommerce and Shopify, and Stamps.com plugs into both seamlessly. Plus, running a business isn't cheap, especially when it comes to fulfilling orders for your customers. Luckily, Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates, which has saved me so much money, I can't even tell you. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. So get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right from your computer anytime, day or night. No lines, no traffic, and no waiting. So set up your business for success like I did when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. There's no long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code lights out. So, Himmler believed the most powerful religious relics could turn the tides of the war, but this obsession got to the point where even Hitler thought that Himmler's focus on relics and the occult had gone too far. Hitler allowed him to carry on with the obsession because Himmler was his most trusted right-hand man. During the war, many SS troops turned to mysticism and black magic, hoping it would help them defeat the Allies. Others went on expeditions looking for artifacts and super weapons, and one of these artifacts was a Spear of Destiny. This artifact supposedly delivered the final blow to Jesus as he died on the cross. 
and the occult legend says that whoever claims a spear and understands its significance holds the destiny of the world in their hands. Some rumors claim that Himmler once had possession of the spear but later lost it. Either way, Himmler had many of his SS troops convinced that this was a strategy to win the war. There was power in mysticism and the occult. To the SS, this was as powerful as a nuclear missile. So if their beliefs were true, then that meant that Hoska Castle would have been prime real estate for their rituals. And this obsession might have been the reason they wanted to control the castle in the first place. They brought along many religious artifacts and symbols, and they also brought enough occult texts to fill a library. These books had been evacuated from Berlin when the bombings became too dangerous there. And some say as many as 98,000 occult books and magazines moved into Hoska. Besides using the castle as a library, many stories say that the SS used the chapel to perform their occult ceremonies just above the gates of hell. And they even excavated some of the property looking for the pit in the limestones that was sealed centuries before. Some believe they would be given unlimited powers if they could find hell itself. And their desperate goal of Aryan supremacy could finally be achieved. Others believe that they could unleash a super weapon from hell and win the war. Some of the SS troops were so convinced in the powers of the occult and black magic, they believed that they could one day revive the most loyal Nazi troops. While some SS bodies were cremated in the chapel during secret ceremonies, other bodies were later found buried very close to Hoska, and they had died from gunshot wounds. Some believe their burials were close to the limestone fissure on purpose, and they believe that if a secret to a resurrection could one day be unlocked, they could revive these fallen Nazi soldiers buried close enough to a high concentration of dark energy. When the SS troops weren't obsessing over the occult inside the castle walls, they were obsessing over human experimentation. And many suspected some of the other castle builders besides the chapel were used by Nazi doctors. Most traces of physical evidence in Hoska were destroyed, but rumors have carried on. This would have been the perfect place for them to perform human experimentation since the Hoska castle was so isolated. Plus, some of the exterior windows were actually fake, and there was glass surrounded by decorative molding, but a solid wall blocked certain windows, so some rooms never saw daylight. Whatever happened here was only witnessed by the Nazis allowed behind closed doors. All they needed was a steady supply of test subjects. During these experiments, Nazis were known for using human test subjects for incendiary bombs and chemical burn research. Others were exposed to disease to see how fast they could die, and if doctors could treat them. But by the end of the war, the SS burned all of the records in the castle before abandoning it. So whatever happened inside Hoska during World War II died along with the SS. Even if some traces of official reports survived, the Soviet troops seized the castle soon after, and it was kept off limits to civilians until after the fall of the Soviet Union. The reasoning for keeping it closed was that Nazi landmines were still hidden around the property. But after the fall of the USSR, the property was cleared of landmines and opened back up to the public. Today, the castle is owned by Miroslav Konopasik, and he's currently working on repairs and renovations to maintain the property. Daily guided tours are often given throughout the week, and depending on the season, you can visit the castle after a car ride and a half mile hike through the forest. Once you get there, you can see how well preserved the castle really is. Over the centuries, defenses, buildings, features, and records have been destroyed. But luckily, a lot of the structures and artwork have been preserved. From the outside, you can see places where concrete has filled gaps in the hillside. And you can also see where the builders use parts of the cliff as the building's foundations that have been there for nearly 800 years. But that's not all that stayed the same. The paranormal energy still thrives at Hoska. Towards the center of the castle, dead birds are often found in the central courtyard. And many believe the dark energies from the castle instantly kill the birds as they fly overhead. Over in the hunting hall, countless pigs, sheep, and deer heads cover the walls. Some of the more recent supernatural horrors are experienced closer to the cellar, also known as Satan's office. This is the deepest part of the castle in its current form, and it has the thickest walls that connect to the cliffside. Those that visit claim that the entire cellar has a dark energy that can't be seen or heard. Many also still hear loud scratching noises beneath the chapel floors. But as long as the chapel stands over the fissure, the portal remains sealed off. Physical creatures might be cut off from the castle, but many believe supernatural energies continue seeping through the floors. 
Some have seen apparitions walking through the hallways. Others have heard screams and cries coming from impossible sources within the castle, especially the chapel. And they occur mostly at night, and some even shake the floors. A headless apparition has also been seen wandering the central courtyard, and pints of spectral blood can be seen pouring out from his neck. Along with the headless man, visitors have also seen a headless horse, a chained man, and a woman in white. Outside, a line of apparitions can be seen chained together walking toward the castle. Each has a horrific injury. Sometimes a black spectral dog can be seen attacking and biting each person along the chain. Inside the main building, there's a walkway on the second floor where many have seen black shadowy figures pacing back and forth. Some eyewitnesses once heard thumping noises and turned to see two black shadow figures descending toward the floor. Then the dark figures whispered about killing little girls. Poltergeist activity has also been witnessed in the castle. The previous owner, Jaromir Simonek, was one of the heirs to Skoda Car Company Fortune. His great-grandfather had bought the castle in 1897, but the castle was taken from his family by the Soviet government. It was later returned to them after the fall of the USSR. During the months Jaromir vacationed there, he had also experienced paranormal activity. One evening, he was actually having dinner on the second floor with a few friends. And when he set his wine glass down on the dining table, it levitated into the air a few feet above the table. He then reached out and grabbed the glass and forced it back down to the table, but once he let it go, the glass then slid to the center of the table. Some other visitors even encountered a chimera, a half-human, half-bullfrog man. His description is like many of the other creatures who have emerged from the fissure centuries ago. He's been seen lurking around dark passages and even hopping into the forest. Many believe he's been trapped here for a hundred years, trying to find his way back into the portal. Over in the chapel, the large room is dedicated to the Archangel Michael, who can be seen depicted on the walls. Many of the world's largest faiths, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, recognize Michael as an archangel. In the New Testament, he's known for battling Satan and his dark legions before casting them out of heaven. So it makes sense he's depicted here on the walls above the hole to hell. But in other places throughout the castle, a lot of the artwork references Satan and demons. In the past few decades, some walls were removed during renovations and artwork was discovered on the old walls. There are pagan paintings of villagers being attacked by hybrid creatures. On another wall inside the chapel, there's a woman who's not a biblical character. The artwork depicts her as a half-lion, half-human, which is another pagan reference to the Chimera sightings from centuries ago. She is seen aiming a bow and arrow at an innocent villager and many noticed she's aiming with her left hand. So you probably heard of this. Uh, it kind of stems back from the Middle Ages that left-handedness yeah. is considered inferior to right-handedness, which is just so stupid, right? People will use anything against you. Um, Roman culture was also superstitious about left-handed people, and when Christianity later became a dominant religion, the culture was then carried on. Some people were even accused of witchcraft just because they were left-handed. Even into the 20th century, people considered left-handedness a sign of impurity, criminality, or filth. And it was never technically an official belief under the church, but this discrimination continued on for centuries. I mean, it's like, I, I had a um, fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Pop, I went to Catholic school. She talked about, she was left-handed and growing up, she was kind of, I don't know, when... I was in fifth grade. I think she was about 70. So she grew up at the time when nuns were a big thing in Catholic school. And, and horse and buggy were going yeah, out. Yeah, right. And one day, the nuns came to her house and had a sit-down meeting with her parents and said, we've noticed that your daughter's left-handed and we believe that she needs to kneel on nails and pray wow. until she's right-handed. Mm. So that... I mean, that isn't far off, right? That's, yeah. that's in recent history. They were this obsessed over being left-handed. Um, and it stems from way back. So stupid belief, but I, I guess that's the thing. So if you ever see someone who's depicted as left-handed in old artwork, Christian artwork or pagan artwork, uh, it's usually hinting like it's your biggest hint that they're evil. Wow. Yeah. That's wild, man. Just shows 
all the silly things we've just dis- discriminated against people for. Yeah, honestly, like we've come so far as humans, but at the same time, we've not come far at all. It seems like right when it comes to finding ways to like discriminate against each other, it's just like really left-handed versus right-handed. Down to that, what what science is behind that? None. Are you right-handed? Yeah. Thank God. Yeah, I know. Danny. Yeah, I'm right-handed. Okay, good. <sighs> We're You're all right here. Yeah. yeah. She's left though, for sure. <laughs> definitely. She's definitely left-handed, so watch out. It is strange that an archangel and a pagan creature are seen on opposite walls of the same religious chapel, but this just shows how the castle's history has weaved in and out of different occupants and beliefs over the centuries. This is why Hoska's landmark of pagan creatures wreaking havoc and also religious heroes casting the devil's legion out of hell. It was first built to keep supernatural creatures out of the overworld, but other times it was used by black magicians, Nazis, and occultists as a sanctuary. Either way, Hoska Castle has been a legendary hotspot of paranormal activity over the centuries, and if you ever visit, the scratching noises beneath the chapel floor can still be heard 800 years later. Are they rats? They, they could be, honestly. But 800 years of reports of this, I guess, that'd be a lot of generations of rats. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what it is, you know. That'd be crazy. There's like this 800-year-old rat family that's just been We've living been here for so yeah. long. This, this whole story reminds me of so many movies. I feel like so many movies are like based on stories of these castles. Like I'm even thinking from the Conjuring universe, the, the nun. Um, you know, there's so many similarities and like, you know, cracks in the floor leading to hell. And, you know, there's that other movie, Drag Me to Hell. Um, oh, I've never seen that, that one. That one's a, yeah, that one's pretty good. But this whole concept of like hell is beneath our feet, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you just go down deep enough, you'll find it. Yeah, it's there. When in reality, hell is, a, is a, you know, according to the religious text, is like a, a supernatural, it's almost like this other dimension, right? It's yeah. not, not, like this it's, physical location within the earth right it's a place where your spirit goes to right right, right. essentially the side the side you know going back to you know this time period people would think you know if i just look up heaven's up there right heaven's right. just up in the sky you yeah, know you yeah. associate the clouds and space as being where heaven's at you know if you go up high enough eventually you'll get there and you know there's the stories of like jesus um ascending into heaven and things like that and i think that's where a lot of this comes from is a lot of the biblical uh references but then hell being you know this don't fall into a hole because you might just you know fall straight into hell straight down yeah and i think that even stems back to like um, greek mythology too yeah like you talk about the Hades overworld and the underworld. underworld yeah, yeah. So maybe it's so interesting, you know, how, how much crossover there is between all of the different civilizations and religious texts. Yeah. You know, they all like to, to, to claim to be so different in the truth and this and that, but there's just so much similarities between all of them. And especially the references, you know, of heaven and hell, they just have different names or different people, you know, Christians, it's Satan and Greek mythology, it's Hades, you know, and it's like Zeus, Jesus, you know, there's all these similarities there. So it's like, you know yeah writers who just steal yeah. from each other right They're just like shit i can't think of anything and this is due by midnight so right I just slap right. this in there but yeah i mean it goes back like if and like even the chimera right this pagan creature that had carried on so if we do the math what's a seventh eighth century bc to to what the ninth century was i think they were saying they were seeing it so What's the math on that? Two thousand years. Two thousand? Almost. Yeah, almost almost two thousand. A little bit shy of two thousand years that that is that's carried on, right? Yeah. So yeah, things. Spiritual stories, I guess, last a very, very long time. We haven't stopped searching for the meaning of life. Apparently, yeah, it's been going on since we, you know, showed up on this planet and hasn't stopped since then. I think I think from a paranormal perspective, though, it makes complete sense that there'd be, you know, this dark energy within this place, and whether or not it's attributed to this crack leading to hell or a portal or something like that's one thing. I do I do find that interesting. Is that, you know, is there something actually there? Is there some sort of 
anomaly that's occurring beneath this castle. I mean, it's on top of this cliffside made of rock. And I think of other places where the similar types of, of activities reported. And I wonder if there's some type of electromagnetic anomaly that's occurring within uh, this cliffside that is contributing to some of the things that have happened over the years or some of the things that people have seen or heard, or if that's just not even a thing whatsoever, that's just like urban legends, just a story that there's this, you know, portal to hell there. But in fact, the, all of the paranormal activity and the hauntings and the ghosts and everything uh, that are seen are actually because of the history itself, especially when you talk about Nazi occupation. I yeah, mean, I mean, I can't even imagine the the things that they were doing there, and I, you know, eventually want to get into a little bit more detail on Nazi doctors that did human experiment. It's it's absolutely insane what they were doing and horrifying. Uh, but when you think about that sort of evil happening in this place, and you know they're practicing black magic and things like that, you know, if you believe in, you know, any of those things being real or having something to it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, people were worried about us talking about Ouija boards right, and, right. and potentially bringing something in here. Knock on the devil's door and he'll answer. Yeah, yeah. I love that, I <laughs> love that. That's a great quote, honestly. Yeah. And so like imagine people potentially screwing around with a cult and black magic in this one spot for, you know, decades and yeah. decades, possibly hundreds of years, you know? And I'm, I'm just, I know the sheer amount of death that occurred in this place and oh, probably yeah. other disturbing acts that occurred here is, is probably more than we even know. Yeah. I mean, again, we don't even have a real like clear understanding of the history here and what actually took place. You know, a lot of things are pulled from word of mouth stories that have been passed down. There's some, you know, history that we've been able to uncover but for the most part, this castle remains a mystery. I mean, we still don't fully understand why the hell it's even there. Yeah. And why it's built the way that it is. And yeah. And they said like, oh, it was just a place where you could manage real estate. Uh, that like doesn't noble, make a lot of sense to me. Noble real estate. Yeah. But still, why not just have a building in the city or like closer to you? Why, why make it here? so hard to get resources? Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. And that's what leads me back to this idea of maybe there is this anomaly or something that's occurring in the ground and either there's something physical there that they can see and that's why they built on top of it or it's this sort of supernatural energy that whoever came you know discovered it was like i gotta protect this and you know kind of keep it hidden and that's why i'm like hmm, i wonder what's under there i wonder if there's ever been like scientists have gone in there and like done conducted studies or like measure the you know if there's radioactivity there or there is like electromagnetic you know influxes there yeah i'd be curious or like scan the ground you know you yeah, can run sonar the into the ground yeah. and stuff and see if there's anything under there they do or just say, fucking dig i know more recent visitors say yeah you go there and there's just like a lot of cement that's been shot into the cliff mm -hmm. side for whatever reason, I don't know if that's just a purely structural thing, just because you know you don't want the a, a yeah. rocky foundation beneath this old historic building at this point. But they do say a lot of it is now filled with concrete, and even in the central courtyard, there used to be this community well, supposedly. Um, well, that's what they think it might have been, but even that's kind of been filled in, and so it's just a lot of. So they're just doing this to preserve like this landmark or historical. Tourism. That's what I assumed that it's hmm. more the foundation and they don't want things shifting around, but I don't knows? think they like charge people to go there. Do they, yeah. or is there like tours that you can do and they yeah. charge for that? But there are charged day tours. I'm not sure now because the previous owner died in 2021 and I'm not sure what the price is or what, if they're still doing tours. Cause I know they're constantly doing renovations mm -hmm. and stuff, but yeah, you kind of got to, drive up there uh take a little hike through the grounds which is like half mile and then i think it's i i think it's like a, I looked it up it was like 125 check currency i'm not sure huh. what it was in the u.s but bet that place is scary at night that i would that's what i would i would love to visit stay at night. That would be stay awesome. overnight in a in a 
gothic castle. Yeah. So this goes back to the chimera and how it was preserved in honey. Um, I was really interested in this, so I just did a little research uh, while this was going on. And apparently preserving bodies in honey is actually a common practice. Uh, it's known as the mellified man or human mummy confection, like candy. Oh, wow. And it's, uh, it's known as a legendary medical substance created by uh, steeping a human in honey. So they like knew they were going to die, yes. they're terminal or something, and yes. this is how they're going out? And ideally, the process would start before death, and their diet would completely change to only honey. Um, they would also occasionally bathe in honey, and it would get to the point where even their feces and their sweat contained honey. Um, and after the person died, they would preserve them in like a stone coffin. They would let them stay there for a century. That's wow. crazy. And after that century, they would take the body out, and it would form this almost like gelatinous stuff. And it would be sold in markets as a, uh, I mean, as, as a very high priced item, but as a medical cure, it I mean, it's, it's been hailed as uh, being able to heal broken limbs and other ailments. And maybe the whole process was to create some sort of me like medicine to try and heal a chimera later in life, maybe a century from then. But we don't know. These are all things that could be, but human candy. Wait, so this was like human goo and honey that they would use as a healing salve or something yeah wow that's so interesting man romans Anybody were want some honey kit some human candy yeah right. <laughs> yeah let's go order some up i bet etsy has some yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah let us know if, if any of you out there have ever been to hoska castle i'm curious to know what your thoughts are you know maybe what your experience was when you were there you know does it feel like it's haunted does it feel like there's something hidden beneath the floors and all the filled in cement now that's just you know festering there let us know but with that being said we're going to go on and wrap up today's episode there thanks again for joining us for another episode of lights out and until next time lights out everybody <laughs>